Hi, I'd like to tell you today about the um, results of a study that was based on interviews conducted with uh, 21 individuals uh, who were um, seeking support, peer support, on maladaptive daydreaming internet forums and other individuals who initiated contact with me in the hope of uh, contributing to uh, future knowledge um, about their distress. Um, these interviews were about the essence, the experience of maladaptive daydreaming. What is it like? We often try to learn in this um, very new field about maladaptive daydreaming from those that we consider the experts by experience. So during those interviews, the um, uh, people we talked to reflected on the impact this intense form of daydreaming had on their lives. Uh, and what we found out, <coughs> a common theme that emerged from these interviews was that they all expressed concern and sometimes, um, quite frankly, distress about the harmful effects of this form of daydreaming. They described a vicious cycle uh, in which they sought comfort from their stressors, the daily life stressors, the emotional uh, stressors in maladaptive daydreaming, but then later experienced further distress about uh, how they wasted their time, which they eased with more daydreaming. So, for example, here's a, a, a typical quote um, by one of the people we interviewed. This person says, I spend most of the day at home daydreaming. I live alone. So technically, I find it easy to dream all day long. My anxiety is that this is how I will end up spending my life. Uh, these anxieties are increasing. I feel like a ghost that misses out on life. The stronger my fears get, the more depressed I become, and then I need to daydream to make myself feel better. It's a vicious cycle, this person says. So this is a, a, a typical illustration of how one uh, experiences life as, as sort of lifeless. As a, she, she describes her, herself as a subhuman. So leading a subhuman life, because the term ghost that she uses to describe uh, this form of existence um, connotes or hints uh, about death. So um, many of the individuals we talk to uh, express a need for change. Uh, they want help. Um, some said something along the lines of, it's really a nightmare. I wish I, I could move on. Uh, it has served its purpose in getting me through childhood um, adversities, but as an adult, I would like to live the life that, that I like. It's keeping me from having a full life, and so on. What we also learned, uh, again, that's something I talked about in... Um, in other videos, in previous videos, uh, is a, the role of motion and music. Almost all participants described uh, a process of initiating the daydreaming through a process of uh, repetitive movement, uh, listening to particular music that sets the emotional tone for the inner uh, script that they are developing, or both. Um, these were almost like induction rituals. Uh, we, we don't understand fully yet what um, what the role of mo movement is. Is some some people, uh, as they ride a car, uh, even as passengers, immediately are triggered into uh, daydreaming. Others, when they go on a walk or, or jogging, uh, cannot help but immediately emerge themselves in, in, um, in, in, um, in their inner world. That is, um, 
dive right, right into it, almost without the capacity to control it. But others uh, uh, create the movement, the repetitive movement, in order to um, launch this fantasy process. It is possible that this repetitive movement uh, creates some form of an hypnotic induction, um, improves concentration, but it is also possible that this repetitive movement activates some brain regions that um, facilitate uh, fantasizing, facilitate concentration. We don't know that, and perhaps future studies with functional MRI will um, uh, shed some light on this uh, fascinating phenomenon. What, what is important to say, though, is that we uh, are aware of a um, body of literature on a, a, a disorder that is commonly identified first in childhood, and it's called, if I'm not mistaken, stereotypical movement disorder. Um, it is a, uh, a phenomenon in which um, uh, individuals, uh, it, it, many of them ch children, uh, move uh, repeatedly, um, uh, rocking or, or swaying or uh, doing some other movements with their limbs. Um, but what is uh, of particular interest to me is that it has been reported in some of the studies that some of these uh, children, uh, we're not sure what percentage of them, reported while they're doing it, they experience uh, fantasy and they are uh, uh, immersed in, in the sense of, um, of uh, inner world of, of, uh, of daydreaming. So um, it is uh, perhaps um, uh, important that um, some cooperation will develop with developmental psychiatrists that study uh, stereotypical movement disorder to shed some more light on this subgroup of uh, children who uh, present with this uh, stereotypical movements and um, report also intense imagery. Uh, another element that emerged, another theme that emerged from uh, our interviews is the importance of um, solitude. Uh, there are many reasons why um, people uh, prefer to be alone when they daydream. Um, for example, one, is, one Israeli respondent said, I understood that I need to spend as much time as I can with other people uh, and not to be alone um, because when I'm alone, I cannot help but, but uh, immerse myself in these fantasies. And when I'm with other people, um, it diverts me. Um, distracts my mind and I cannot do both. It's very difficult for me to do both. So this person came up with an idea that she must be with other people, but what is typical for most of our respondents is that th they would much rather daydream than be with other people. Um, for example, one person said, I very gradually came to understand that if I arrange my life so that I have frequent social interactions that I couldn't avoid, it would be much more controllable than, um, uh, than otherwise, but uh, my, my fantasies are just much more fun and people make me nervous. So people uh, have a diminished motivation to engage with other people, some, some of the people we talk to. Um, um, many of them are um, socially withdrawn, um, shy individuals, um, and in their minds they uh, experience themselves as um, 
very self-confident and uh, experiencing no anxiety whatsoever with regard to uh, their interactions with other people. Uh, what about contents? Um, the content worlds associated with monodeptive daydreaming vary, vary greatly. Um, uh, every person creates um, a fantasy that suits uh, his or her uh, needs perfectly. Um, so our interviewees tended to develop ongoing stories, sometimes alternating between favorite, different favorite inner worlds that could evolve infinitely, much like a daily soap opera. Um, some some storylines uh, started in childhood with um, characters uh, aging and developing. Um, so, but beyond the many uh, specific plots and scripts described to us, uh, two main overarching themes emerged: uh, relationship and family life would be one, and social status would be the other one. So, with regard to relationship and family life, many participants preferred to um, uh, create complex scenes involving love and family relationships. Um, to give an example, one said, I would daydreaming about family, mainly a brother and a sister, about 17 years of age, very beautiful and successful and they were each other's best friends. They had lots of friends and they felt deep love for each other. Sometimes I never, uh, the, the, the intensity of this deep love was uh, much greater than that which I ever had in reality. Uh, so this, this quote um, gives us um, a, um, an appreciation uh, about perhaps an unsatisfactory existent family experience and the uh, create, creation of a compensatory, compensatory inner uh, family, um, substitute family, that has obviously become very rewarding to, uh, to, our, to some of our respondents. And with regard to social status, um, Again, uh, similar needs perhaps were um, operating here. Um, uh, let me give you an example. Um, the first memory that I have is a daydream about saving people. I think I was uh, in first or second grade and I would imagine that something terrible would happen to my classmates and I would save them. And I still do this kind of stuff. So um, these are these are this is an illustration of of somebody that you know in in deeper discussion with this respondents it, it it came out that she um, was um, uh, not enjoying a very um, a popular status in, in in class and was a socially withdrawn individual. Um, that really sought to um, uh, achieve and receive recognition uh, for her talents, for her, uh, for her worth as a human being. Um, what, uh, what are some other important issues that, um, that we need to, to stress in, when talking about this kind of um, Phenomena. Um, so, unlike uh, musical imagery, um, for example, a tune that plays in our mind, maladaptive daydreaming imagery is full with emotion. Uh, the people um, talk about uh, uh, love and, uh, and fear and, and, uh, and uh, longing and excitement and pride. So this is something, of course, very different from psychotic hallucinations or post-traumatic flashbacks. Uh, maladaptive daydreaming imagery uh, is very rich and very diverse. 
and people report crying and laughing and all kinds of emotions, sadness, happiness, um, uh, ha um, love. Uh. So the key word in, uh, that, that uh, was prominent here is, was the word create. They talked about creating different scenarios, dif different scenes. Um, seeking the experience um, of um, corrective experiences, uh, corrective emotions. Interestingly enough, some of our uh, respondents talked about the pleasure of um, fantasizing um, um, interpersonal scenes that uh, and experiences that involve uh, horror or anxiety or tragedy, eliciting um, sometimes even tears or um, uh, ph physiological reactions of perspiration or heart palpitation. Uh, when I asked them why would, would they do that, uh, since they had the choice of um, uh, scripting some much more optimistic stories, uh, some of them um, asked me, well, why do you like, why do people like uh, spicy food or hot food or chili, chili peppers? It's painful. But, uh, you know, there is some control over this pain and there could be some pleasure in this pain. Like, you know, people perhaps playing uh, uh, with uh, bondage in their erotic uh, relationships. Uh, it's all under control. It's, it's playful and you create uh, a seemingly aversive experience, but since it's under control, you uh, enjoy the feeling of, of controlling it. And others gave me examples of riding a roller coaster, which uh, creates fear, or going to horror movies. So apparently there's a fine line there between pleasure and, um, and, and suffering. And when people are in charge, and they are the ones who uh, uh, script the, uh, the fantasies. Apparently, there's a double kick here of being able to uh, set yourself in a scary environment, but in which you are in full control. So, uh, to conclude, it is obvious that uh, we're dealing here with a unique phenomenon that... Um, it's not like the fleeting daydreaming, um, this default mode of mind wandering. We're talking here about a phenomenon that it involves uh, purposeful, very elaborate, very rich uh, scripts and scenarios that elicit emotions, sometimes storylines that go on, continue for um, uh, months and years. Um, that fulfill emotional functions, but that it, um, are also very time-consuming, uh, creating distress and um, interfering with daily functioning, because there's only so much attention resources that one could allocate to uh, um, in, you know, in, in any one particular time. So if all of your attention resources are allocated inwardly, it must be at the expense of your attention. Uh, now careful, uh, you can um, uh, attend to external uh, responsibilities. So the, um, if you want to read more uh, about this particular study, it's called Parallel Lives, a Phenomenological Study of the Lived Experience of Maladaptive Daydreaming. And it was published um, last year in the Journal of Trauma and Dissociation. Thank you.